Hi, everyone. Carl Mendonisco here, UIA TV. We've got a really great show for you today. I got the man of the hour, Mr. Made in America himself, Mr. Christopher Guerrero. Chris, what's happening, man? Hey, Carmine. Well, let, let's let's talk about what's happening, right? October 21st, next Friday, Inventor Showcase. We're going to have a, a great show. We, we're we're going to have some, some really top-of-the-line professionals talking about the industry, whether it's uh, uh, patents or it's getting on TV, retail ready. But then we're going to have a pitching contest that uh, they'll get a chance to pitch to QVC, HSN, and All-Star Products. And the winner, two winners of that will... Get a trip out to Vegas and do it live. How good is that? Yo, it's crazy. I've been getting calls and updates from people. They just want to come and pitch. And I'm like, no, you got to go through the workshop. You know, there's stuff you got to do. Everybody just wants yeah, to pitch. And I, I think it's important that they understand how to pitch, right? And like what their product, what they want to show as, a, as an importance to it. And, you know, another good and really big announcement for the United Adventures Association is we just locked up the inspired home show contract. So that means four days, four full days of all of our experts on stage, educating the community, doing pitch panels, March 4th through the 7th in Chicago. So that's going to be another fun show. Yeah, that's uh, that's huge for us too. I mean, this is the first time the UIA has been uh, at the Houseware show for a number of years. And to give us that much is just awesome. It just shows how far the UIA has come. Yeah, we, and we we got such really have such a great network of professionals that want to help. So on that note, we're going to bring in our guest today, East Coast West Coast power <laughs> attorneys, JD Hoopner and Joe Fargo, baby, across the <laughs> across the nation. <laughs> it sounds like it sounds like the World Series. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, you know, it, it, Joe's a Mets fan, right? You know, I'm a Yankees fan, so I was rooting for the Mets. Hopefully, he roots for the Yankees. I hear the Mets fans don't like the Yankee fans. I don't know. I, I'm not. I always want New guys. York. I always want New York to win. Yeah, there you go. And then you got JD. I know he's all over the place. He's a Seattle football fan. Are you a Dodgers fan? I'm not. No, Mariners fan. Of okay, course. he's all Seattle. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so he has no, he has no, no race in it. Although. Seattle made had a great run in baseball, right? And now they're now they're they're playing the Atlanta. Yeah, I think we are. Yeah, yep. yeah. Second no, no, round. the Phillies play Atlanta. No, Seattle plays. Um, you caught me. I'm not a baseball fan. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, Seattle. But I, but I know we're in the playoffs. Yeah, no, that's I right. No, it's, it's Atlanta. Seattle's playing um, our 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 nemesis, the uh, the the Astros. Okay. So we have to. So I'm going to be a really big Seattle fan because the Yankees struggle with Houston. Even during the uncheating times, they've struggled with Houston. <laughs> all right. So today we're going to talk about intellectual property. I mean, we can go on all day with this stuff. We can talk about patents, trademarks. But today, let's just focus on, on, on the IP aspect. You know, JD handles a lot of the, like the inventor stuff, the new process and, and, uh, and, and really the prep, when to do it, when not to do it. Joe also handles that, but he handles also the back end, the litigation, when you need somebody to really kick somebody's butt for you or, or when you're in a mess. When you have somebody really infringing and or your patents have run out and you're not sure what to do, Joe will jump in and all that. Let's get started with JD with you. Let's talk a little bit about, so when is it? When is the right time? When do I come to you and say, hey, should I file a patent today? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, for certainly first-time inventors, there's a lot of anxiety around, you know, is my idea good enough? Yeah, and, and, you know, and for an inventor, most of the time, they're technologists and they want to get their their product, their method, their software, perfect. And it's sort of this idea of never having it actually be perfect. So I always encourage people to take steps forward, reach out, have a discussion with the patent attorney. If you think what you have is unique, it really is that simple. If you think what you have is first of its kind and you're not quite sure, reach out. See if what you've got is not just an idea. See if it's actually an invention, right? An invention is something that you can explain to someone in the field, you know, with, with words and drawings, how to build it. So if you're far enough along to where you could tell someone else, even though you probably shouldn't, right, keep it confidential, how to go build it, then you've got an invention. And now the, the work is before you to see, okay, is it truly unique and not obvious anywhere in the world? And that's one of the first steps we take with our inventors is a very rigorous patent search process. And our patent attorneys review that search 
our third party search team puts together and gives our inventors the answer they're looking for, should I file a patent on this? And it's, you know, it's one of those cases where it's um, not always rosy, right? Sometimes we come back 30 to 35% of the time. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> the margin on this, the, the scope of rights we can get for you is so thin. Um, are you sure we could get you a patent on this? Do you think you can actually go to market and make money on that? Um, or shouldn't you go back to the drawing board and take another look? Um, depending on what the business goals of the inventor are. So yeah, it's a crucial step. And it really, I think, especially for first time inventors and some of those that are small businesses that haven't been in the industry very long, they don't know what else is out there. It's so eye-opening for them to see other products, other published material they had no idea existed, right? And so somebody, oh my gosh, I'll show it to an inventor, they'll get this huge list and they had no idea. They thought they were the only player and do they're not. So it's very, very eye-opening from a marketing perspective. Uh, like I said, I always encourage an early discussion with an attorney if you think you've got something unique. Mm -hmm. And so, Joe, on your side now, I've seen you work on on patents that weren't that that were at least a, an attempt that weren't very good or had some holes in it. How do you go about firming that up? So even even when somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, listen, I've had a patent and it it's like stale now," or I've, I've at least been going down the the road to get a patent and and I've had somebody now really copying my product. My pants not foolproof and you get involved. I've seen you go to work and I've seen you move stuff pretty fast and get that that patent so that it's uh it's bulletproof. So how, how do you go about doing that if somebody has that issue? All right. Well, for, I mean, every case is different. And certainly, as uh, JD just explained, sometimes in certain places there's gonna be a very is a lot of stuff mm -hmm. out there. And sometimes there is not. Uh, and some folks who are in the technology space who are familiar with the competition will say, okay, I know everything, um, or I think I do. So my, my work when I come in typically is when, the, you know, the, what, you're, what every, every inventor, 90% of them, and JD could correct me, but 90, 95%, you're going to get a rejection by the patent office, and they're going to cite something and say, look, we think your claim may be uh, too broad. Now, you know, JD will likely try and get you guys as broad a scope as you can, but as he was just saying, you, you know, some people are only entitled to a very narrow uh, scope of protection, but that comes that's part of the examination process, give and take with the examiner. When I come in, I've seen where, uh, you know, where someone might have given up so much scope where they didn't have to, um, or someone might be making an argument that didn't work out. But if you leave the argument in your prosecution history, it could end up holding you back. You may not realize that. So, but at the very, it, it all actually all from the very beginning, if you give your patent attorney as much information as possible, you can allow them to do a better job for you. Um, so folks who are just throwing an idea and asking the patent attorney to just build it up for them, that's not, I don't think that's a good way to go. You might, that might not be the right time. Um, and, and when it got, when it, if, if I had to take a situation where the patent, where the patent attorney was given so little, there's almost really nothing I can do. So it's, it, it, I guess, in other words, my job, it really is kind of contingent on the particular case. So if someone has a lot of stuff, some people have a lot of detail. But you have to realize if you make your if you make your now we, when we were talking about pat we're talking about patents and the scope of protection you might say well what is that the, you know every patent has these things called a claim if you don't believe us look in you know look on Google patents pick any any seven digit number you like and you go look on the on the page it shows claims it says claims and they're numbered one through ten or one to twenty or whatever and what's important about that um, you know Chris is is that those claims are actually what you protect they tell people what you can't do so if you know if what you can't do is very narrow then like jd was saying it's very narrow scope of protection for me that's difficult to sell you i mean if someone comes to me and says you know joe my patent attorney couldn't get me you know protect my product i might say well look you know you know you have to, i don't know i didn't have that conversation with your prior attorney but someone like jd would tell you hey you're not going to get all of this and you know inventors small businesses whomever have to go in understanding if you, you know, working at the very outset, you should know, I might not be able to get the protection I want. When, then when it comes to me, you know, I'm not a miracle maker in that way that I can't, you know, the prior art exists um, that says, look, that technology was already out there. I, I'm not going to be able to claim it. And patent examiners get paid money to do that. And we want them to do that because, you know, some of, I think some people will say, look, if it already exists out there, maybe I can take it and rejuvenate it, make it a different concept. And 
when people talk to me, Chris, I mean, that's another thing too. I say to them, I say, well, maybe, you know, maybe this reference that was identified was over 20, 30 years old, but it's not being used right now. You could see people make that a business strategy and say, maybe, you know, maybe I can re remake this into, into my own thing. I may not get a patent for it, but maybe there's some other ways. I have those hard conversations with people, which, you know, look, if you do, if you, if you follow JD's advice at the very beginning, these inventors can maybe understand by the time if they have that, have that conversation, they won't be, you know, surprised. Some, unfortunately, I've, I've met people who, when they talk to me, they're shocked when they hear, I can't protect this but you know it, it comes down to doing the first doing the having those hard having those hard conversations early like jd recommends and i think by the time i get in you know if i have to get in then you know there's no surprises but i yeah but there's certainly other situations where i've gotten people much broader claim scope than what they were having originally it just it, it's a case-by-case -case analysis yeah so so jd i, I I'm, I'm new I, i've got a, this great product I think it's going to sell millions. Well, you've heard that a couple of times. Before. <laughs> yeah. So what, what's no. the next step? I call you up. What's next? Because I, because I, I always hear people say, "Oh my God, it's like seven thousand dollars." No, it might be fifteen grand if someone starts questioning what, and it starts really getting pulled back and forth for design. So I come to you now. What do you need from me to to get going? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would just start asking questions and. Um... First one, you said you, you you think it's going to sell. I would ask, have you already sold it? Okay, have you already published it? It's one of the very first questions we ask. And this is the big red flashing light. We always tell inventors, sometimes it can be a heartbreak discussion. If it's been sold or published, known in the field for more than a year, it's going to be ineligible to file, right? So it'll be invalidated if you do file. it. Um, so hopefully it's been within a year. There's a one-year grace period here in the U.S., now, now, what, say what, it now what if case. it's something similar to it? Not exactly the same type of product, but similar. Okay. So let's say, you know, you, you have invention A, you sold it more than a year ago. It's been doing great. You want to get a patent on A, uh, but you've, you know, in the past six months, you've got A plus B, a really awesome improvement to it. You've added some cool gears, some additional sensors on it. Mm -hmm. The answer to your question is, well, it's those improvements. The question is, are those improvements novel and non-obvious? Could you potentially protect that? Okay, just those improvements and would it be worth it? What might be 10, 20, 30 grand in getting that patent? Um, would it be worth it to use the market uh, opportunity large enough to move forward that? And that's an answer that we can't always point to. We're attorneys, we're going to tell you whether we can get you a patent or not. It really is on the client to go do their homework and go do market research, know the industry. Um, you know, one can do that initial, you know, uh, entrepreneurial question of, hey, do I move forward or not? Do I take this risk or not? And it's us, you know, our job to tell them how big of a risk is it. Yeah, and um, you know, yeah. and I and I, I see a lot of people get really excited when they get a patent, which is great, right? It should you should celebrate, but but again, yeah. you need to figure out how much you're going to spend on that patent and what's the return, right? And then yeah. and then I'll, I'll kind of guide this over to Joe a little bit. Then then you start. Let's say you do start selling a lot of them. Oh, guess what? <laughs> Look, it just popped up some copycats, right? So there's a cost of getting a patent, right? Then obviously you want to be able to return that investment. But then, Joe, you got so many copycat, and you now you have a patent. Well, how does that go? Because I, I I can tell you, I mean, we can talk about this forever and all day long. But big companies, if they do like your product and they're going to copycat it, you have to protect it, right? So what does that mean? That means you have to litigate it. That means more money, more dollars, and can you sustain that type of fight in a, in a battle in, in in a court? And this is what you do, Joe. So I I don't know. I I always bring that up because I want people to understand that just because you have a patent doesn't mean the world is yours now. I mean, how many stories have I heard where people had these great patents that were strong that still are copycatted and still say, come, come get me. I have a big bank account. I'll run you out of cash before you actually can win a battle in court with me. So how does that go, Joe? Yeah, well, I think it's, again, it goes back to when you had that first initial conversation with JD or his group, you might ask, you know, I'm going to sell millions of these. I mean, one thing is certainly all the things that JD mentioned, but secondly, if it's making that much money, someone else will probably want to get in on it, especially, especially if they, and I, one of the things I usually ask inventors is, do you know how to make this? Do you know, have you considered how to make it? And I always, you know, I, it's, I hear the pause on the phone or if I'm in person, it, you know, the sort of this exasperated look. And I, I said, you know, you have, you should know. Right. And I'm not, I don't give business advice, but I can say from my own personal experience, you know, getting the molds, 
making those productions, getting it packaged, doing all the QC, if there's regulations on your product, you have to pass all those. So like, like, you know, JD was mentioning before, if the investment is worth it, then yes, yeah, so you might say, look, I can afford spending that much for a patent, but then you're right. You spend all that money and all of a sudden you get copied. Then what happens? Well, um, one thing is if you have a patent, that's a good thing. If you're in the process of getting a patent, still a good thing. You want to make sure you work towards getting that patent issued because just filing a patent application gives you no protection. I cannot sue someone on a, uh, a patent application that's been published. It has to issue, which means you have to get over the exam. You have to convince the examiner to allow you a patent. So, so let's say you go through all that rigor and you did it, and you got the you know you got that really pretty looking booklet now, and it has your pictures in it, your name. Now someone starts copying you. Well, remember in the earlier in this uh, podcast, we, I mentioned that word claims. Well, that, that is what you need to check. You can look at your claims. They're all written in English and read them and say, is that claim describing the person's thing that's copying me? Now, this goes back. This is sort of like a, a, a cohesive conversation. If the, the claim you read does not read on that competitor product it doesn't mean you don't have a case but it mean you, you would need to talk to someone like myself to see if there's a way to capture them if the claim does not cover your product or their product you might have to have a serious conversation with your patent attorney to make sure that you have it straight because it may be you know and I, i've met all types of people people who said i I'm selling a product, the attorney, the, even my predecessor attorney will say, before I get involved, you can't cover your product, we can't get around the prior art. But they, they say, well, our board of directors wants a patent anyway, or you know, my whatever, we wanna just say we have something patented. That's fine, JD or I could get you a patent, but will it be something powerful or useful to you? It may not. I'm always gonna push you to get the most useful thing for the money you spend. But if you just want a patent, which some people do, you gotta beware, you can't, you know, just because you're selling a product and a patent covers your patent covers one feature of it, and someone does the same thing, but maybe not that feature. Well, it could be really close, but just not that not close enough to be you know to be an infringement. So let's say we get beyond that hurdle. Let's say it is. You know, let's say that claim we just talked about covers their product. Yeah, then you'll have to bring a case. And how you go about doing that is, you know, there's very different ways. I'm sure you can watch all sorts of TV and movies about the underdog. The point is this for all the listeners. If you're going to invest in getting a patent, you also have to consider investing in enforcing it. And, and by the way, I always tell people, if you want to get a patent, there's three different things you could do with it. One, you want to make, you know, you want to manufacture using it and, and, and then enforce it one day for people who want to copy you. Two, you want to use it as an investment vehicle so people could buy you because a lot of folks who want to invest or buy your company will think you're more serious because when you have IP, it's not guaranteed, but that's typically a way that I see to do it. And three, if you're ready to actually transact with it or use it for a defensive purpose, which we didn't get into, but let's say, you know, you make a product for your, you know, for your business and it's infringing someone else's patent, but they like what's in your patent too. Now you have a trade. So now there's no cost and you can go along and not spend all the money, uh, Chris, that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. So those are to me the three specific reasons and you have to be vested in it. You have to have skin in the game. It's not helpful when it's like, oh, I want the patent attorney to do all the work for me. You're not going to get a good result. Just like if you do a litigation, like, hey, Joe, can you file this lawsuit for free? Well, the problem is with me. It's like, you know, I have to feed, you know, I have to feed my, my family and <laughs> take care of my house. So I can't do it. Well, I love to do that. But it's also, I think a lot of times, a lot of these strategies are, um, you know, and there are going to be times where it's going to be the, this small business is going to have to make a choice. And then you have to say to yourself, if you're selling these things like hotcakes, then maybe you could invest the money to defend it. because. Uh, you know, I will go after, you know, the, if it's a good case, I will go after them, mm -hmm. but you have to have some investment in the, in, in it's, I, I think it's perilous, whether you're prepping and prosecuting your patent application or pursuing enforcement of your patent, not to be invested. I don't think it's a good business. I mean, I don't know of many business people who have a business that they're just not invested in. I, I don't, it, to me, it sounds like it's a, it sounds like a hobby more so than a business. Right. So I think that if you if we all put the reality glasses on, you realize like, you know, the patent game is just that it's a it, it does take a lot of investment on, and it doesn't always require, you know, I, I also don't believe that you should spend 
tons of money, drain your pockets and lose all your profits over a patent litigation. There's ways to do it efficiently, which I've done. There's ways to find ways to, to get an early resolution, a licensing deal, some way that the parties could come together. But yes, making the right moves, saying the right things, that's the type of stuff that I would be asked to do and I will do. But going in that, going into this process, if you're going to go down the patent road to know all this, and I, it's a lot to heap on an individual inventor or a small business to say right from the outset, oh my God, I have to think about it. But to me, it's like when you buy a car, you know, you got to replace its tires. You got to fill it up with gas every day. You have to clean it. You're going to have to get registration insurance for it. So it's no, and all it is, and, and by the way, the price these days, at least, is it's actually probably cheaper to get a patent than it is to buy a new car. <laughs> yeah. But the point of the matter is this, and, and I don't want to speak for JD on that front, but you know, if it's a technology is detailed enough, you make JD do enough work, I'm sure you can get up there. But I'm saying that if you do, <laughs> if you if you have if you if you invest enough time, do enough to due diligence, research, given you know, if you give detailed drawings and specifications and details to JD, and then you you can make the most out of your vehicle, like if it wasn't you know using the car anecdote or metaphor. I would think that that's the same way you should look at it. So the better, you know, if you want to make this race in your business using a patent, then you might as well get the best you can, you know, do the best due diligence you can, the best research to get the best car, AKA patent you can. And that way you can drive it to the finish line, whatever that finish line may be for you. Yeah. And Joe, that's why I bring it up because I want people to know it's a full circle on the cost. It's an investment and you have to be fully committed and, and, and be part of it. Right. Otherwise, what do, you, what do you get out of it? So you get a piece of paper, hang up on your wall and say, I have a patent, great. But if you're not going to use it or enforce it, then what's the point of having it? So just to wrap this up and close it out. So JD, typically, uh, someone comes to you, what's what's some rough cost uh, to get started? Yeah, yeah. And, and real quick, Chris, I wanted to come back to something that, uh, that Joe was saying. Um, and just to highlight it. So um, don't just get one patent. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Don't just get the parent patent. And I, I, I'm sure it's on the tip of Joe's tongue. I mean, as you go into settlement, if you go after an infringer, and by the way, people think infringement, oh my gosh, oh no. It's, oh yeah, someone's infringing. That's a good thing, okay? Generally a good thing. It means that there's someone interested, someone's buying it, someone's selling it. And it's likely, if you play air cards right with Joe and his team, uh, a licensing partner, okay? So don't think of that as a bad thing, but I, 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 one of the big soapbox things I say is don't come away with one single patent. In almost every case, it makes sense to follow a continuation, a child patent application to develop the portfolio more. One of the most, probably the most advantageous positions to be in when you're trying to settle with an infringer is having, having that pending app ready to go. They could change it to match the infringer. If they're trying to design around you, you still have the ability to change your claims midway. And another thing I want to mention before we wrap up is patent insurance. I'm not an insurance salesman, but I talk about this all day long. You can get a policy on your patent application, even while it's pending. And that can have a war chest, right? You can actually develop a, a complete you know, half million dollar uh, policy for five grand a year. It's not, not cheap, but it's an interesting thing to consider. And I've been urging our, a lot of our clients to consider it if there's you know, a, lot of, a lot of contingent you know, prior. Um, anyway, so you're at, your question was cost. Um, the initial upfront uh, search, you know, you're going to pay a few grand, 3,500 is what we charge. That's a, not a small investment. That's why that, that looking before you leap, we have a lot of skin in the game for our inventors. They need to put a lot of money up front to see, is this really a journey I want to go down uh, to spend what could be 10 to 20 grand. So yeah, on the easy, low complexity side, 15 to 20 grand all in on the more complex side, 30 plus grand uh, to get it all the way granted. And that, you know, like I said, that's the single patent. And then the cool thing about building a portfolio is it's just a few extra grand, four to five grand to get that continuation or a continuation in part or a divisional to keep a really cool family alive for, for a lot of years. Hopefully answer right. your question. No, that's yeah. great. So come on. I think this is great stuff, right? We, we've got the East Coast, West Coast. We've got the U.S. covered, right? Yeah. But, but more importantly, we've got these guys are pros that do this all day long. They're going to be part of the Inventor Showcase coming up for the October 21st Zoom event. And then they'll be in the, the, the Vegas event with us at the National Hardware Show, the Inspired Home Show, all the big events that we have. This is the team we have. We have great guys with great knowledge. And I think both of them are engineers. Not that I'm, you know, you know being an engineer, it's, it's an engineering group. You know what I'm saying? Carmine, sorry. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, <That's> the, okay, <laughs> so... 
what a what a great group of people we have, really. And 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 you get a chance to meet both JD and Joe in person. So if you have questions, you have things you want them to work on, they're happy to help. So I'm excited at what's coming up. We have a lot of good events to close out the 2022 year and then roll right into our PGA show in 2023, National Hardware Show, and then the Inspired Home Show, all in the first quarter. Yeah, I hear you, man. You know what's great about this? Anytime I know you guys are going to be on, I stay at a Holiday Inn, and then I claim that I'm an engineer, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Man, awesome. you're in the mix with all these inventors. You might as well be an engineer too. <laughs> By trade, I'm serious. You're, you, I'm going to give you. I'm going to pass my engineering step. I, I always I'm, joke when I ask someone, "What kind I of am. engineer are you?" Pardon? They don't say mechanical. I say, "There's what do you mean? There's only one type of engineer, right? Mechanical." Oh. <laughs> 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 no, I, 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 have robot, I have. Uh, yeah, I did my robotics, and I have. Uh, I have a. I have a science degree too, though, Carmine. Yeah, unfortunately, so, and, wow. Uh, yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. You know what I like, and I know we're going to close up, what I like about what both you guys and, and even Chris, what you guys do, to me, it's a whole strategy. And that's the part that I like from the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. getting your product, getting the patent all the way through to what Joe does. It's all a strategy and working with the right people. You know, the strategization is, is really the kind of stuff that I love and seeing it all come together. It, it so much helps in the end when you look at the entire scope of the project. And what, you know, the questions that maybe you should ask up front that might happen down the road. If you do it early enough, you're spending your money wisely. You've got a really good budget and your plan is of execution and the strategy just plays out. Yep. I think it's awesome. All right, cool. Well, we'll close up the show. JD, Joe, thank you so much for being on today. For all you listeners out there, make sure you, you sign on on the 21st. You'll see these guys live. You'll be able to talk to them, ask questions. And, uh, you know, for myself, for Chris Guerrero, we thank you for listening and we'll catch you guys soon. You all take care.